Okay, so I think we are now we are now live. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Massimo Martelli. I am a, a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy, and I am the General uh, Secretary of ISTVS. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this fourth event. Uh, in our 2021 uh, digital event series. Uh, this is, uh, as probably some of you already know, uh, this is a series of events that takes place on Wednesday. Uh, at the time, uh, we chose to make it possible for uh, all our international colleagues uh, to attend. So midday in Europe, Africa, mornings in North America, and evenings uh, in East Asia. And we've been alternating between uh, informal uh, student-led research seminars uh, and lectures, uh, which are our Terra Mechanics Bytes or Terabytes, as we call them in short, uh, by established uh, researchers. So today uh, we are having a student uh, research seminar uh, on factors that influence uh, BIVAMeter terrain parameter identification. And uh, uh, our speaker today is Ray Kruger uh, from the Vehicle Dynamics Group of the University of Pretoria in South Africa. And um, before starting uh, with the actual seminar, I would like to give you uh, some, some quick information. So uh, on the sidebar, on the, on the right-hand side uh, of your hoping page, uh, you'll find uh, a section called Sessions. And in there, uh, you will find a tab called Chat. And I would like to invite uh, every one of you uh, to please use uh, this tab uh, to introduce yourselves. Uh, by typing your name, uh, your affiliation, and your uh, and your research interests, uh, and please uh, use this tab just uh, for that purpose. Then, on the same uh, se uh, section, you will also find uh, a Q and A tab where uh, you can instead uh, type uh, questions for our speaker. And uh, at the end of the seminar, we will have a Q&A, uh, an open discussion, uh, also with the possibility uh, for those in attendance to be invited to share uh, their audio and video and join a live conversation, if so they wish. And uh, I think uh, that's all for my introduction. So. I think uh, I'm going to leave it to our speaker for today, Ray Kruger. So, Ray, if you are ready, uh, you can take it from here. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, Ray, I think you're good. Awesome. Hello everyone, my name is Ray Kruger and I'm a master's student at the University of Pretoria at the Vehicle Dynamics Group. My background is in mechanical engineering and my research topic is on factors that influence parameter, parameter identification. I've been working on this topic full time for approximately one year now. To start off, I would like to give a little background as to why Terra Mechanics is important. So Terra Mechanics has applications in many sectors. These range from agriculture, mining, transport, and space exploration. The problem we face globally is that climate change is real and the agricultural sector contributes to 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Also, 33% of the population is employed in this sector. Yet, 11% of the population is undernourished. From both a humanitarian and environmental standpoint, there is a need to increase the agricultural sector's efficiency. 
Electric vehicles and automation in agriculture has opened up new and more efficient mobility concepts. A recent study by McKinsey and company showed that the largest potential, this has the largest potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in this sector. Characterizing the terrain properties is an important step and forms the basis of all further modeling. My study focuses on bevometer based soil characterization. Even today, the most widely used bevometer, the most, uh, the most widely used tire terrain characterization uh, interaction models are based on backer drive theory that require bevometer based soil characterization. Although there is a lot of re literature available on bevometer soil characterization, certain factors are still unclear and use outdated testing methods. One of these factors identified are that bevometer tests should be carried out at representative tire contact patch areas. However, this is often not the case with scale test equipment being used that only apply representative pressures. Other factors have also been identified. How does linear versus torsional shear compare? What is the influence of shear velocity? What is the influence of contact area, not just pressure? for both shear and pressure sinkage, grouser size and surface finish, and then also most studies do not provide confidence intervals on soil parameters. We want to determine what influence these factors have, especially at representative tire contact patch areas. How did I come about this topic? The idea came to me when I implemented a very simple backer wong model for rigid wheels on soft soils. I'm sure everyone in this audience should be familiar with it. For those that are not, I'll quickly go over the basics. We start off by estimating the elastic sinkage. Then we calculate the wheel entry and exit angle, followed by estimating the normal and shear stress distribution under the wheel. If we integrate these uh, we find the forces in the vertical and an horizontal direction. If the wheel force, the vertical force matches the applied vertical load, equilibrium is reached. Otherwise, we iterate until equilibrium is reached. When we compare the simple model with experimental data from literature, we found that the normal stress under a rigid wheel matches the experimental data well, as seen in the top right. However, the shear stress distribution over the uh, was overestimated as seen on the bottom left. This leads to an imbalance between shear stress and normal stress distribution, which eventually leads to an accurate drawbar pull results, as seen on the bottom right. One possible cause is the inaccurate shear measurement in the swirl parameterization step. But without access to regional bevometer shear test data, it is hard to tell what is the origin of this imbalance of forces. The original authors also found the same effect. The original plan to take the study further was to obtain our own soil data, as well as experimental data on an actual vehicle by measuring the drawbar pool with wheel force transducers. I conducted a pilot study by driving the front wheels of our test vehicle and applying the rear brake to induce slip. The results were promising, but we ran into a stumbling block. We require the swell properties for the Packer Wong model. This leads to the current study on bevometer based swell characterization. As of today, I haven't actually performed any bevometer tests yet, so the rest of the presentation is an exhibition of the hardware I developed for this study. This is the bevometer I'm working on. It has three degrees of freedom. It can translate linearly in the X direction with a force of 3,500 newtons. It can translate vertically in the Z direction with a force of 6,500 newtons at up to 15 millimeters per second. It can rotate about Z with 630 newton meters of torque up to 75 RPM. In the vertical direction, it has a, carry, a carriage that can be decoupled from the displacement actuator to allow force control with static weights up to 650 kilograms in 20 kilogram increments.
To measure the applied loads, I've developed a custom four degree of freedom load cell. This load cell can measure shear, bending, torsion, and actual forces, all with full wheat stone bridges. A custom load cell was developed because no commercial solution was available that matched our loads and because they are exuberantly expensive. It is a 7.2 millivolt per volt sensitivity. For those that know, this is three times more sensitive than commercial load cells. The load cell was modeled using the finite element approach because of the complex geometry that is not trivial to calculate with continuum mechanics methods. The geometry was optimized for maximum sensitivity with a coupled parametric fair model in SOLIDWORKS and a numeric optimization in Python. All of the geometry seen on screen was determined through optimization and had nine geometric input parameters and 20 constraints. The calibration of a multi-degree of freedom load cell is a bit tricky. This is because it's difficult to apply pure loads experimentally, especially in shear and bending. Instead, one can experimentally apply combined loads and use the data and regression to build a model, which is alternatively known as the calibration matrix. On the right is a setup I use to apply loads in all sorts of combinations and directions. At the bottom left is an example of a calibration matrix from the theoretical finite element model. It works like this. If you apply a design load, for example, in the FX direction, you measure 2,400 microstrain on the FX channel and negative 800 in the bending or MY channel. If we simultaneously apply all the design loads, we measure a strain on the FZ channel, which is the sum of the entire of, entirety of row one. Ideally, we want the diagonal terms to be large and the off-diagonal or cross-coupling terms to be low. If we invert this model, we can figure out what was the applied loads, even if there is cross-coupling or deviation from the theoretical model. Here are some of the calibration results for six different data sets. Each data set has a different combination of loads and directions. The bottom left hand figure displays the effect of cross coupling. Note the blue data set is lower than the other data sets, but the model is able to capture this phenomena. Also note on the zoom in plot on the top left hand side, you can see I didn't just plot a few point measurements, but there is actually enough data to perform inference. I think overall there's uh, about a million data points. If we plot the distribution of the residuals of the model and take confidence intervals, the maximum expected error can be found. All channels exhibit error in the order of 0.9 to 1.7% error, except the vertical channel where 11.9% error can occur. However, this is expected as the load cell was only optimized for shear and bending. This is because of one simple reason. The cross-sectional area required to withstand the torsional loads made it insensitive in the vertical direction no matter how well your load cell is optimized. For this direction, the bevometer incorporates alternative S-type load cells in line with the carriage. To control the bevometer, I developed a simple control system. It consists of a Python GUI running on a control PC. This communicates with an embedded controller seen bottom left over Wi-Fi at 300 Hertz to control the plant's three axes. It implements a simple PID controller that can be live tuned from the GUI. On the right, you can see an example, for example of a velocity step response of the system. The measurements are quite noisy, making closed loop control difficult. Also apologize for the quality of that graph. Finally, we can see the test location and soil bin I'm currently constructing. The soil I plan on testing is indicated on the USC soil classification chart. I'm planning on using a well graded soil of a mean particle size of 0.1 millimeter. And I want to add approximately 5% water content 
and compact the soil so we can hopefully see dilation and make the shear rate effect more prominent. Uh, thank you very much um, and I'm open for questions. Okay, okay, Ray, uh, thank you very much. And I see a first question has already uh, come in, but uh, since this is uh, one of the of our student led uh, events, uh, I would like to to invite one of the leaders in our ISTVS uh, student group, uh, Mohit Shenvi, uh, to please to please join us here on the live session and and moderate our uh, live uh, Q and A and an open discussion. So, Mohit, if you are if you are ready, okay, I see you. So Ray, one of the questions uh, that we had is, so when you post, uh, like you showed in the last slide that you want to test the, uh, like the sandy soil, uh, even Bainan has the question. So why do, is it exactly that you have chosen sandy soil instead of loamy soil? Okay, uh, good question. So, Obviously, agricultural soil ideally um, is, is loamy soil. Um, but in South Africa, where we live, um, I did an analysis of the, the, I got the soil map that classifies the, the soil types. And we predominantly actually have quite sandy soil with uh, low uh, clay content. So it is actually a bit representative of the conditions we can expect. And then also, um, for this test, we want really controlled conditions. So that's why I have a, 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 like a well-graded soil from a specific supplier. So we know our soil is uh, very uniform for these initial tests. And then later on, we have a second soil bin that uh, directly next to the first one, where we will actually then put in uh, a representative agricultural soil um, that we hopefully can test the vehicle on as well. So I hope it answers your question. Nice. And another question that uh, I had is if you go back a couple of slides, uh, you showed there was an error in the vertical direction for the load cell. Could you like elaborate on that a bit? Uh, so, okay. Can you still see my screen? Yeah. Um, okay. So the, the reason um, is basically you will be able to withstand the torsional loads we expect. Um, there's no feasible solution uh, where the vertical direction could also be optimized. So uh, it was a compromise that had to be made. So we only optimized for the torsion and the shear. And then we will use a second, second load cell that goes through linear bearings, uh, S-type load cells to measure the vertical force. So we offload that component to a separate load cell. Um, in that way, we can get accurate results basically for all the directions instead of making a compromise. So, thank you. Um, if you can, uh, like, this is just one thing that came to my mind. If you hit hide, it would be like we can see your entire screen. It seems to hide some part of your screen share. It won't stop your screen. If uh, you must I just stop my screen no. share. Okay. Uh, beyond that, uh, I would also like to, uh, there are several more questions in the Q&A tab, but uh, instead of me asking them, I would like to request an, everyone in the se live session that they can click on share audio and video blue button and they can join the call and we can have a live discussion of their questions. Um, there's two more questions I see here. I can answer them. Uh, so Sergey. Uh, asked the question. Uh, he said, is this installation applicable to Chernozium and loam? Uh, it's a type of black soil in Russia. 
Uh, it, it definitely is. We can test any type of swell with this, um, this Beva meter. Um, and it actually has a mobile unit uh, that's already been designed so we can go deploy it in the field. But for the initial tests, uh, we, we um, are going to do it in a swell bin with this controlled sand. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely for future studies to experiment with different soils and see the effect of, you know, the plate size and the shear rate and everything on different, uh, different soil types. Uh, it's definitely a good investigation. I hope that answers your question. And then Anonymous said, it looks like uh, you spent a lot of time on hardware development. When will you be testing? Um, yes, so that's true. Um, I'm only busy with a master's degree, but it, a lot of hardware had to be developed for this project because we didn't have basically any any theory mechanics hardware. So that forms a lot of part of my uh, my my thesis. Would you call it? Um, it's actually just developing the hardware and then testing it and then doing my my investigation. So, and then, yeah, I will be testing soon. I actually had this morning my soil delivered. Um, so t testing is hopefully soon in the pipeline. How do I plan to mix this soil that is homogenous? Okay, so this soil is already graded or the ones I plan on testing first. So it's already been, it's been washed and sieved um, to a specific profile. So it's highly, highly homogeneous already. Uh, it's got a mean particle size of 0 0.1 millimeter. So it's a, a very controlled soil. And then the university, the, the civils engineering department has already done a lot of uh, their research on it as well. Um, so that's, that's uh, why I'm using it. But if we were to use, say, a loam soil um, that we excavated, that we plan to use the land rivers uh, or testing vehicles on we would have to sieve it and then definitely yeah mix it um, to make sure it's consistent and then also obviously the swell preparation uh, procedure uh, i've got a whole one planned out uh, we the machine itself has got a rake um, built in and a leveling plate um, so we will use that and then also obviously compact it with a roller and such to make sure it's uniform so we have repeatable test results. Uh, and then Cesar, uh, sorry, I'm very bad with pronouncing names. Asked the oh, sorry, of the... uh, so, sorry, sorry to cut you off, uh, Ray. Uh, yes. I would like to reiterate uh, Mohit's invitation. So I see, uh, as you were mentioning, a new question come in. Uh, from Cesar, uh, another one from Andres. Uh, so if if someone who has typed uh, a question or is still planning to type a question would instead like uh, to join us live on stage sharing audio and video for a real uh, live conversation, we would really we would really like that. So, of course, uh, if you are not willing to to do this, uh, Ray will uh, will just read the questions and uh, and answers answer them as he's been doing. But uh, yeah, please please consider uh, joining us here on stage. We would really like to take advantage of these these events to to make our, our community grow and and as a part of our general community make our student community grow bigger so uh yeah if you if you are inclined to do so please consider uh joining us live on stage thank you sorry ray uh, i'll leave it to you okay um to answer caesar's question um uh, he asks, the development of the bevermeter uses the translational prose. Uh, is the rotational ring? It is not a rotational ring bevermeter. So that's exactly one of the things we, we outset from the start to do is to compare the two. So this bevermeter can do both translation and rotation. And we're going to compare it directly to each other. 
and see how they differ because there are different opinions. I think Upadaya and a few researchers have used the linear approach and then others have advocated the torsional ring approach, uh, but there's no direct study between the two. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I hope I didn't miss any questions. I'm just going from the top. Um, Andres asks, how many tests do you, have, you expect to have performed to gain confidence in the parameterization and characterization of the swirl? So that's quite difficult to say beforehand, but the plan is to obviously just do a repeatability test. Is so one of the first tests I'm going to do. Um, is do a test, do a couple of tests, so let's say like five or ten tests, and then see how the um, standard deviation decreases the more tests you do, um, or the standard deviation levels off basically. So once the standard deviation reaches a constant value you know you don't have to perform any more tests it's not going to sh shrink the confidence interval so once you, if you have like one or two tests your confidence interval is very massive because you have few data and then as you do more and more tests it the con the standard deviation will decrease up to a certain point and then it will level off um so yeah it's it's kind of you have to determine it experimentally Yeah, I think uh, I think I answered all the questions. Um, yeah, I think so. So, okay, you know, we have we have another uh, one, one from from Doctor Keen. Keen. Yeah, please, please, uh, right. Do you have access to the wheel talk sensor sensing to compare the bevimeter data with wheel test data? Yes, so we have wheel force transducer. Um, it is just a matter of, you know, creating a rig, uh, like a swirl bin rig, to, you know, um, be able to turn a wheel for, I'm assuming you mean um, dynamic tests, but yeah, you know, the first step would be to do static tests, just the sinkage of a, like a actual deformable tire in the swirl as well to compare to the, um, to the, to the bevimeter results, um, the sinkage results, and then f later as well, you know, dynamic tests, but that requires a whole setup. So we do in essence have the equipment, but there are also missing links. Um, did someone try to ask something? I hope that answers your question, Dr. Keen. Yeah, hello, am I back on again? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, just to follow that one up, um, I've done this with um, putting torque sensors on tractor wheels. And obviously you've got small wheels very often on the front and the back, so you can get quite a, quite different data. But putting torque sensors on and then locking the wheel, then pulling the whole vehicle, uh, you'll then get a uh, force or shear, total shear force uh, translation uh, diagram and it also allows you to get the deformation modulus for that particular wheel um, and then that would allow you to compare some of the data with what you're getting from the bevimeter to see whether it's it's close or there is any variation um, okay and Thank I you. think because uh, you showed uh, uh, was it a defender Land Rover a bit earlier on yes your side? I, so I have some of uh, the sort of test you explaining but the wheel wasn't uh, fully locked up um, oh. where I just partially applied the brake of the rear tire and then drove the front wheel so it induced slip and then yeah I measured the torque with wheel okay but tools. with 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 the um, defender you probably got the same size wheels on each corner is that right yes so even if you haven't got um, uh, torque sensors if you lock all four wheels and then pull the whole vehicle and if you can measure the displacement against the force with a load cell you then get uh, one wheel times four so that would be a, a relatively easy way of collecting sort of similar uh, data um, wow. and that should give you allow you to get defamation modulus of what's actually happening uh, on the 
on the wheel as well as 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 getting the the total um share versus uh, translation deformation uh, okay. curve and of course it's not too difficult to load up the corners um uh, equally um but it, it it's something i've done in the past and it, it it's quite a useful way of checking to see if uh, if the uh, uh, the test data corresponds to the the real, real data, vehicle. if you like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get your shear force versus displacement graph. Um, interesting. So the whole vehicle, if you if you haven't got torque sensors for each wheel, and all the wheels are the same size, and well, but if we do, hopefully uh, you've got the same load on each wheel, the downforce in each wheel. Uh, then, which isn't too difficult to do, then if you pull all four, it's four times, you know, one wheel times four. So, uh, and it's very easy to get the uh, um, the contact patch. We used to throw flour around the wheel, uh, and you can get fairly close to a, a, a representative contact patch uh, um, well, yeah, on yeah. a small displacement. Um, just drive away and see, and then measure it. Um, you can do it in various ways. Obviously, you can take a photograph or you can trace through the contact patch. And then, uh, in fact, what we used to do was cut out the contact patch and then weigh it as the easiest way to get a quick uh, quick contact patch area. I think we actually have those tech uh, pressure sensors. Um, but uh, and, and Yeah, get, I, I suspect if you might have a little bit more sophistic, sophisticated instrumentation, but the, the, it's not too difficult to do anyway. If um, Compared to the amount of time you're spending on developing the instrumentation, those sorts of tests uh, would be sort of relatively quick. Okay. And you recommend I include it in my, in my study? Um, well, uh, if, if you think it's relevant, but... Um, uh, it's always nice to see what's actually happening on real vehicles and then try and compare, um, you know, test data on on soil, uh, whether it's uh, um, uh, phi or, uh, or, or whether it's cohesion or, or deformation modules, whatever it is you're interested in, shear rates and so on. It's always quite nice to be able to compare what you're collecting in the lab against what's actually happening on on real vehicles to see that uh, how close the um, how close the data corresponds. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, it can even go the opposite way where that's the real vehicle, the bevel meters in the intermediate, and then you can even the soil data from like a shear box or a triaxle test. Uh, you know, it can go even more to the lab side. And, you know, it it would be interesting to compare all these things. Um, yeah, if if you if you've got uh, torque sensors on each wheel, then you can lock one axle and use the other axle to drive uh, the vehicle forward, and you can get a shear displacement um, uh, data um, uh, that way. Um, with tractors, it's quite easy to use, for example, the big wheels uh, to pull the smaller wheels or uh, something similar. But uh, I. I mean, I have done it by pulling the whole vehicle as well with a load cell. So um, that's uh, one one possibility. The other thing, of course, is that you can actually use the vehicle when you go to a new test site. You can then use the vehicle to actually collect the, the soil data by locking one wheel or one axle uh, and then collecting your data that way. Okay. And for so the pushes. The pressure yes, sinkage part, uh, how would you obtain it, uh, the pressure sinkage part using this method? A bit more tricky. Um, uh, I mean, the, the fudge I would tend to use is that ideally in agricultural operations, you don't have any sinkage or you, the sinkage is, is so small, it's very difficult to measure. Um, and, and therefore, the, you're mainly interested in the, um, the you know, the, the slip shear slip uh, characteristic rather than sinkage which on um, a lot of modern tractors with low pressures the sinkage is really quite difficult to measure okay with thank that, you very much dr keen it was quite insightful oh in uh, thank you alex and in the meantime i saw cesar uh, joining us on stage welcome Welcome, Cesar, and 
please uh, feel free to to unmute and and join the conversation. I think, um, is he there? I don't know. Uh, yeah. It was, um, it is quite difficult as a, um, you know, participant to, somebody has to accept you, um, I know. So maybe he's waiting on being accepted. Um, no, no, he, he oh, is he's already accepted, I think. He oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I see. He's, he's here now. Yeah. Cesar, I. Uh, Can please. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Please, okay. please yeah, go I ahead. Have, I have some problems with my microphone. Um, thank you for 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 the presentation. Uh, I have a question. Do you have a, a former version of the Viva Meter at the University of Pretoria? So I see, uh, I can find uh, a lot of studies and results uh, from the different. Uh, researchers uh, about uh, terra mechanic, but uh, not much about the um, uh, a former version of the of the Viva meter, former than than the Viva meter that you developed in in this in this study. No, so I'm I'm currently it's in the process of being developed, so it's brand new. Uh, it's all um, from from scratch. Uh, starting this year, I developed this, um, or end of last year. Uh, developed this bevermeter, so it's it's brand new. Um, if you're asking if University of Pretoria has done thermomechanics research, I think I'm the first student. Uh, we do mostly vehicle dynamics, uh, but we have a professor with experience in it. Um, and then there was a bevermeter long ago in 2005. Um, there was one th uh, doctor's thesis in agriculture. Um, that had a bit uh, like a very crude bevermeter at our university, University of Pretoria. Um, so, but that bevermeter has been lost um, through the ages. So, that's why I'm developing this new new one. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question I have: uh, Why do you use not only the shear forces? Uh, the um, normal force on the on the shear plate, but also the bending resistance in in the models in the okay. models of Becker, Wong, and Hanosi. I'm not. Uh, um, uh, there 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 are used the, the the just the vertical forces and the and the horizontal forces over the plate. Yes. Where where do you? Are going to to use the bending resistance that you that you are measuring uh, with the with the load cell, the special load cell that you developed. Uh, good, good question. Um, so yes, just in the models we use the normal force and the shear force. Um, the bending is to be able. So this load cell has cross correlation between bending and shear. Uh, it's very small, it's like 8%. So you have to measure the bending to be able to compensate for it. So I think any load cell basically, if you, even if you take a S-type load cell, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with a S-type load cell. If you apply a bending on it, um, it will actually negative, you know, it will pick it up as a vertical force. So it's to be able to cancel that out. Um, that is the, the, the reason for it. So we only actually measure the shear, but if for some reason, say there is a rock in, in the ground and you're doing pressure sinkage and there's a bit of eccentric loading and it causes uh, you know, a, 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 a small bending moment, this load cell will then be able to compensate for that. Yes, I understand. Thank you. And a uh, last question. Uh... Do you know already uh, which um, um, share speeds, share velocities, and share uh, and footprints areas uh, are you going to use? 
Yeah, so uh, I, when designing this Beva meter, I had to obviously work off some um, literature loads uh, and, and such uh, and calculations. So the speeds, it can vary between 0 and 15 millimeters per second, uh, which is relatively fast for this type of test um, in the linear direction. And then for rotation, it can do 0 to 75 RPM. We actually have a 7.2 kilowatt motor on there. And the speed control is very, it's, it's quite fine. So we can go from quasi static to the high speeds. And depending on your shear annulus ring size, so if it was up, uh, say, 35 millimeters uh, outside diameter, you can reach like very, very high shear velocities, which we think is actually quite representative of the uh, shear velocities under a wheel. Um, and then the, the specific um, plate sizes I'm using, I'm, I'm busy finalizing that. Um, but I did the initial calculation to be able to spec the, um, the load cell. Um, but it will definitely be in the paper that I publish on, on this. Nice. Thank you for your, for your answer and congratulations for your work. I have no Th thank questions. you very much. Uh, thank you for the questions. It uh, was nice. OK, so I think uh, it's, it's time to, to wrap up this event. And um, I would like uh, to thank uh, Ray for his presentation and uh, all everyone in attendance today and all the people that submitted uh, questions uh, in our Q&A or um, participated live um, to our discussion like uh, Alex and Cesar. And uh, I, I think, I really think we had uh, a very nice discussion today. Uh, today here so I'm very very satisfied with how this event went today and uh, and also before I forget I would also like to thank uh, Mohit and all the wonderful staff at ISTVS that is contributing to to this series and is making uh, this possible and uh, before uh, uh, I let you go. I would like to um, um, give you just a few, a few quick, quick final announcements. So uh, let me just quickly uh, share my screen again. And so, uh, just to remember that um, we have a, a web page for for this. Uh, event series, and you can see it uh, on screen right now. And um, uh, you can find there um, all the details and, and registration links for, for each event. And uh, the page is being constantly updated. So, so please uh, keep an eye on it. And um, I would also like um, to invite uh, all the student research groups uh, out there um, to join us uh, in this initiative and maybe consider uh, being our next speakers in uh, in one of these re uh, research uh, student-led research uh, seminars. So I think uh, this is a good opportunity um, to provide an informal look. Uh, at your research work and have a nice uh, chat and then uh, useful informal uh, discussion. So uh, if you are interested uh, in this, uh, we, we still have a few, a few spots open and you can, uh, you can check uh, once again, our website for for the schedule. So, if if you are interested in this, uh, please uh, email me at uh, gs 
at uh, istvs.org and we will be free to to arrange this and uh, and get you in the schedule in the schedule uh, also uh, i would like to quickly uh, point out our our next uh, terabyte uh, schedule from for august 25th at the same time Oh no, sorry, not same time. Uh, please note that we uh, we have a different time for uh, for this one uh, to adjust for uh, Dr. Richter's need. So this this event is going to be a full uh, Terra Mechanics by lesson uh, by Dr. Luth Richter, uh, ISTVS first vice president and regional secretary secretary for Western Central Europe. And it's going to be on Terra Mechanics models for uh, lunar and planetary rovers. So we expect this to be to be quite interesting. And um, and as you know, this digital event series uh, represent, represents our build up uh, to the ISTVS uh, 20th International and 9th Americas Conference, which is taking place online. Uh, from September 27th to September 29th. And you can find all the details at the conference website, conference.istvs.org. And well, that's, uh, that's really it for today. So uh, thanks again, uh, Ray. Thanks again uh, to everyone in attendance and I hope to see you, uh, all of you, at the next event. Goodbye.